Welcome to Managing Uncertainty, a podcast series from the experts at Bright Path discussing global risk, business continuity, and crisis management. Will you be ready to lead your organization through its critical moment? So, Jen, major events. Major events. Shareholder meetings, board meetings. The Super Bowl. World Series. NBA All-Star Game. Major League Baseball All-Star Game in Minnesota last year. That's right. Hmm. Red Bulls crushed the ice. The crushed ice. Which, for those of you not from Minnesota, you probably have no idea what that is, but it's an outdoor... What, what are they What are they riding on? Is it snowmobiles? They're on snowmobiles. No, crushed ice is on ice skates. They're on ice skates. Yeah. See, I don't crazy. even know what I'm talking about. Yeah, it's crazy exciting. It's by the Cathedral of St. Paul. Yes. It's, it's definitely worth looking and up. It is insane. it's a huge event. State um, Fair, for that matter. The Minnesota State Fair, the largest state fair in the world, despite the fact that we're not Texas. <laughs> yes. <that's right. laughs> yep. I mean, the inauguration of the president. So these are huge sense. events that happen, and they don't happen in a bubble. Companies have to deal with these events because they cause all kinds of disruption. Yep. Not just the police or the National Guard, but individual companies and organizations have plans for these types of events. So the Super Bowl is going to be in Minnesota next year, February 4th, 2018, at the new U.S. Bank Stadium uh, in downtown Minneapolis, and it's going to cause absolutely no disruption whatsoever. <laughs> no traffic. No traffic There'll be no traffic. There'll be no security checkpoints. That's right. No, it's going to be a huge uh, disruptor. It it's going to be a great event for the city and the, and the state. And it's very um, exciting. And it's very exciting because it, I might actually get to see the New England Patriots win again. Well, I mean, Maybe. Maybe. But nevertheless, it's going to be a huge disruption for the city and a lot of the organizations that operate inside the city. I actually got my start in crisis management um, in a major event unintentionally. This was not what I had planned on doing, but I was running um, security, corporate security for um, our former employer in New England in 2004, when 2003 and 2004, when the Democratic National Convention was held in Boston in 2004, the first post 9/11 political convention, and if you and there was no disruptions there at all. No, not at all, not at all. I mean, everybody thought that this was going to be the site of the next attack, that the the world was going to end, and we were going to have gas or anthrax or uh, nukes or active shooters or, um, I mean, everybody thought something just really nasty was going to happen. In fact, I remember during the convention, there was an actual report that came out from the Law Enforcement Coordination Center, I forgot what it was called, but the big command center that coordinated everything, came out with a communication that parachutists had been seen landing on a building near the fleet center, as it was called back then, and that they were actively searching for you know, gunmen or what, I don't remember. Clearly you know, bad guys. Yep. Bad guys, I mean, it's 13 years ago. But... Um, we wrote a pretty significant operations plan around this convention, mostly because uh, not only was there just the security issue of this convention and a huge security zone around it, but if you know anything about how Boston is laid out, um, there's a 10-lane underground interstate known as the Big Dig, Interstate 93, and it runs about five feet from the foundation of the Fleet Center. And when the Secret Service took a look at that going into that political convention, they said, well, that's got to be closed during the convention and to close that you have to close the feeder highways and to Everything. close those you got to close the streets that feed onto the highways and the next thing you know and i was in retail i've got a whole slew of stores in the metro boston area that um, i couldn't move freight to or from i had people that could not get to work or come home from work during a good 13 to 15 hours of the day and when i called our former employer's headquarters and said, how do we plan for this? Surely we have a crisis management team. Surely, they said, there must be a plan. Uh, no, you should make a plan. And I'm like, I know nothing about how to do this. <laughs> but we learned. Yeah. And um, that ultimately culminated in me coming to headquarters the following year to help build an actual crisis management team. And that led us here, yep. you know, 10 years after that to Bright Path. But major events are a huge thing, um, and we've already heard from some of our local clients here about the Super Bowl, and, and what have we been hearing? Yeah, so that's one of the reasons that kind of stemmed this conversation this morning is with the Super Bowl coming in 2018, a lot of our clients are looking at 
making plans or what do they do? And they have a lot of questions around how do they prepare for such an event. And it is a year away, right? But it's actually not that far in crisis management planning world as far as planning for something like that. No, as we told a client uh, last week, the time to start planning for this is now. Or six it months is. ago. Six months ago probably <laughs> would have been better, but um, there's a lot of possibilities around major events. Um, the, it, it, it actually starts with, if you think about you know having an event like the Super Bowl, one of the first challenges is, is anyone from your company going to go? Like, are your senior executives going to be there? Which I venture to guess many most, of them will be. Most will. Um, even if their name's not on the building or they're not directly involved in the event, it's the Super Bowl. Yeah. I mean, they're going to go. Right. So how do you protect that asset? Right. And so there's a challenge there around their transportation, their tickets, their security posture. How do they get out of there? Um, those are all things that if you have an executive protection team, those are things you're probably should be thinking about already. But when you get past this, the people that are going to the event, um, these events like the Super Bowl in particular have a security zone. There's going to be an area around the facility that you're not going to be able to enter or you're going to have to go through security screening in order to get there. It will disrupt traffic in that area. But the crowd is also going to disrupt traffic in the area. So if you're headquartered anywhere near one of these events. Or you're running a business in the area. Or you're trying to run a business in the area. This is either going to be the best week of sales in your life. If you're, say, a bar and restaurant across the street from the Super Bowl. Or a retailer selling right. ibuprofen. Or it's going to be <laughs> post hangover uh, yeah. stuff. Or it's going to be the worst week of your business life because you're simply not going to be able to, to operate. Yeah, you won't be able to get your employees there due to traffic and congestion and um, potentially other protests or things like that that may block traffic. Or not not being able to get supplies there, not being able to get guests safely in and out. It could become a huge disruption. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's the other issue of um, there'll be crimes of opportunity that occur throughout the area, pickpocketing, um, Depending upon the event, there will be alcohol involved, which will likely lead to what more assaults and more, um, you know, violent crime kind of incidents spurring from the uh, the drinking that goes along with a sporting event uh, or a political convention. I'm not sure which is actually worse. That's right. Than and the on, other. And on the other note, you know, while we're planning to prevent damage or prevent violence from happening. Those that cause violence are probably preparing and planning to cause violence as well. There's also yeah, there's the there's the risk of deliberate targeted attack, uh, terrorist attack, a lone wolf, uh, some um, just um, individual, some other challenges that decides that this is the place where they're going to make their this, they're going to make their stand. Right. So how do you plan for maintaining that vigilance and um, preparing for deterring that type of Activity. Well, there's certainly some of the normal physical security things you're going to do, but I think a big a big part of it for companies is how do you, you know, normally what you're when you're thinking about physical security for your building, you probably have an open lobby, and then you have security or receptionists that have been trained by security that are kind of that front line of defense, and you have some kind of response capability if there is an, an incident that escalates in your lobby, a disgruntled employee, a, a unhappy customer. But here's the situation where what you probably want to do is start to push your perimeter out. And it depends on your, your footprint of your location. But um, I know often what we did at, at our former employer is we would secure at the perimeter of the building. And then we would put some plain clothed people farther out so we could see and get live reports of what was going on yep, out there. For us. Exactly. So you think about it's almost counter surveillance where you're both looking for suspicious activity or protest activity. Was, for, for us, anyway, it was often more protest related than anything. But you're, you're, you're pushing the perimeter out and you're putting some eyes out there on the ground where you can see what's going on. But when it comes to the possibility of an attack, they're actually also conducting counter surveillance. They're looking for people who are surveillance. We're looking for people who are surveilling uh, our premises yep. uh, in order to understand 
what they might be, you know, it's an early indicator of an attack. If something looks suspect, it probably is. It's suspect. Exactly. So the see, see something, say something, the DHS version of that. Right. Hopefully executed a little better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> then there's the what do you do when something happens situation, and that's where, when it comes to planning at least, we think that um, – it's good to have a plan in place, integrate it with your existing crisis framework or event framework, but how do you manage these escalated situations? And then I, I think it's a good one to kind of be creative in terms of what might happen and do we need to put specific plans in place around some things related to that. Right. Um, it's also a situation where, um, you know, when things happen and you're in your kind of normal state like if an event, if something happened today, it's unlikely we would think anything of that other than we would go on and deal with the situation. But if something happens that week of the major event or during that time frame, well, everything is escalated because it's, it's different. And it could be, particularly with an attack, it could be a probe. It could be, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this and I'm going to watch how you respond. And I'm going to use that tomorrow when I do my actual attack. During that Democratic National Convention in Boston, the week before the convention um, in Woburn, Massachusetts, there's a large regional transit station, uh, commuter rail, subway, bus, and I don't remember what else, par huge parking garage, parking ramp, as we would say in Minnesota, was across the street from this retail location. And we found, um, the security team at the store found um, luggage, a bag in the parking lot which was really weird. And because it was close to the convention, we were treating anything that we saw as much more intense than we normally would. So they called the police. So the Woburn police came out and they you know, didn't touch the bag. They gave it an outside physical examination. It was laying on its front. So the back was sticking up with a luggage tag. Okay. The luggage tag had a phone number on it. They called the phone number and the phone number was disconnected. And that the officer was not dumb that set off every alarm bell. Mm -hmm. The next thing you know, we had the Massachusetts State Police bomb squad out there with a robot. And not long after that, the FBI shows up to watch. And they used the robot and they blew this suitcase up in the parking lot. And we spent most of the rest of the day picking up someone's dirty skivvies <laughs> from around the store. But what I thought was interesting about this event is that um, we had a little huddle right after, and we were included in this discussion out in the parking lot. And so we've got a couple law enforcement agencies, and we got a bunch of, of FBI agents. And the FBI agent said, hey, listen, you know, we were just here to observe because of the convention next week and, you know, a little heightened awareness. But the main point we want to make is, um, okay, so this was just a package, and it's just full of dirty underwear, and it's probably all legit, nothing to it, but... If there's another package that we find anywhere near here, everybody's got to do this differently. You've got to stage differently in the parking lot. We want the vehicles elsewhere. We want, as a retailer, we want you to do this instead of what you did, which was this. We want all of this done differently, and we want a whole lot more people here. And that's fair. So you learn from the mistakes of it, and right. you get better and better. But what they were actually getting at is that could have just been a probe. Mm -hmm. And now they know how we're going to respond. So when they come back, it's going to be for real. So how we're going to set up and do some things differently. Sure. And, I, and I thought that was just very enlightening from them because none of us were thinking right. about that at all. Right. At and I think, I think most people don't because they just it's not in the forefront of their mind unless they work in this industry. Mm -hmm. But it's not necessarily in the forefront of their mind. They're looking right. at events, events like that, like the Super Bowl is really fun, exciting events. And they are. But they also um, open up a lot of room for bad things to happen. There's also a lot that happens with major events around public-private partnerships. What, what, where are some places that companies could go to get information in these situations as they start to plan? What have you seen from your past experience? Well, so, I mean, you can get those partnerships with your local law enforcement and law mm -hmm. enforcement partners. So right. the county or the city that you're running a business in you should be able to partner with those organizations to get a lot of information on what they're doing and how you can help each other through mm -hmm. that situation. I know Minneapolis has already started some meetings for the Super Bowl next year. Planning, yeah. um, that the emergency management 
uh, department is running, but they have the police and the fire department and the uh, the city and the 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 Vikings as the host team and the stadium staff. And I mean, they've got a whole thing going on. Right. That's going well. But there's a lot of your normal partnership programs that are out there that it would be good to start in today if you haven't in advance of a major event. Um, the FBI has InfraGuard. They do. And for um, companies, uh, Fortune 500 companies, really, there's the Domestic Security Alliance Council or DSAC that has a pretty significant amount of information. And then the local field office may also have some other local programs um, that help point you in the right direction. Um, city, state, county emergency management, city, state, county police, sheriff's department, state patrol, state police agencies, all are good places to go to, to find this kind of information. Yep, and also your neighbors. So you're in, a, you run an organization, you have neighbors, and they have their teams too. So it's definitely a non-competitive space, these types of things, to help each other out to get through them. Not helping any competitor with anything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. We did the lot. I mean, in retail, we talked with our competitors all, all the time. time. It always felt like a. I was always warned at conferences when I was off slinking in the corner with my counterpart from another retailer that we were creating an economic vortex of some type <laughs> over in the corner. Yeah, but trying to um, fend ourselves against these types of. We events. were really working on uh, price fixing baby formula. Yep. <laughs> We did it all the time, too, especially with workplace violence. So mm -hmm. we partnered with many, many other organizations around workplace violence and how to prevent it. So mm -hmm. it's helpful to get the take on everyone else around you so that you all can be working together. So major events are a great example of when you need uh, really a separate plan, uh, integrate it into your crisis process, uh, work your partnerships, um, start early. Uh, we want you to exercise your plan around this and what other closing advice would you have Jen? I'd say one of the biggest things is we we can help if you have questions around this or you need help with this we're here to help we can help to plan these kinds of things and we have specific experience in these areas we've planned Super Bowls and all-star games World Series events shareholder meetings political conventions yes. board meetings yep. still planning board meetings for some clients mm -hmm. all right well, that's our take on major events. We look forward to, uh, to talking with you again on the next episode of the Managing Uncertainty podcast. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Managing Uncertainty, produced by the experts at BrightPath. To receive notifications of new episodes, join our newsletter at brightpath.com or subscribe to your favorite podcast player, such as iTunes or Google Play. Learn more about the services and trusted advice from BrightPath by visiting brightpath.com. That's B-R-Y-G-H-T-P-A-T-H dot com.